Next time, indie comic called Dinosaur Rex. If something with that title is not more fun, then I think fun might be dead too. The comic was lame, fun is dead. Let's reincarnate it with Animax number one. Yeah, doing the intro to this stuff after the theme song. Honestly, this whole situation reminds me of what happened with Brute Force. For those of you new around here, Brute Force was a comic I covered years ago. Marvel's attempt to create a toy comic and then license it to toy companies that failed spectacularly. But they've revisited the concept once or twice in more modern books, mostly to make fun of the goofy concept. I loved Brute Force for how silly and over the top it was, but I wasn't originally going to review it. I had solicited an image comic called The Others that was pretty unimpressive by comparison. And thus is the same with Dinosaur Rex. You know what? why I put so much emphasis on covers, whether it's ignoring them for a trade or going into detail about them for single issues, because I was sold on doing a review of this book based purely on the cover. I mean, look at this. The name Dinosaur Rex with silhouetted dinosaurs and Explorer holding a rifle, some other Explorer woman who apparently forgot to put on her shoes, a dinosaur wearing clothes, and the viewing globe from Power Rangers. This is a cover that makes me want to read it. Dinosaur Rex was not a bad comic, but it wasn't a very interesting comic, and the plot details didn't help. Some rich asshole kid learns that he's gonna stop receiving a monthly allowance from his rich aunt and uncle. His uncle is missing in Africa, which they refer to as the Dark Continent in a bit of period-accurate racism, because I guess this is an alternate early 20th century. And the aunt has squandered the fortune, and they must now seek out their uncle to try to get more money from the treasures he's obtaining from Africa. In this world, dinosaurs are not only more common, but they can talk and have psychic powers, as this dude apparently can use said psychic powers to create a thunderstorm that spooks a horse race that uses dinosaurs instead of horses and allows the rich kid to win a bet on the race. Obviously, a dinosaur with psychic powers sounds fun, but in actual practice, it's pretty damn dull. The rich kid is perturbed by the fact that he may have to gasp, get a job, and everyone speaks really formally and uptight, and it's just lame. After two long, long reviews of heavy stories full of emotional resonance, personal issues, political issues, and just infuriating writing, I wanted something a hell of a lot more fun and stupid to look at today. So allow me to introduce you to Animax. Animax was a toy line a very quickly failed toy line, though that's mostly due to business-related shenanigans. Toy collector and designer Mel Bernkrant in 1985 was trying to come up with new ideas for a toy line. He got inspiration from the fact that vehicles were often named after animals, and thus asked, what if vehicles were animals? And in some parallel universe, a rich franchise exists around people keeping tiny cat-sized Ferraris and minivans as pets. No, no, no. Rather, big combat vehicles that were actually cybernetic beings. Going with the name Animobiles, an idea that no one, and not even him, liked, but they couldn't think of anything better at the time, they sold the idea to the small toy company Shaper. This was going to be Shaper's big attempt at something more ambitious than the board games and stuff they usually made. Burncrant came up with a general story idea, after finally coming up with the better, if less descriptive, Animax name, and while the toys were developed, he also pitched Animax to Marvel to see if they'd be interested in producing a comic for the toys. They loved the story idea and signed on, apparently willing to go gung-ho with it being more violent and have more death and destruction than one would expect from a toy licensed book but eventually got cold feet for some reason, and instead relegated the book to their Star Comics imprint, which is normally where they put their more kid-licensed stuff. 
some of which we've seen before on the show, like Air Raiders. Still, a comic promoting your toy isn't a bad thing. It worked for Transformers and G.I. Joe, after all. Unfortunately, the comic didn't premiere until after the toy line had died. So what happened there? Well, the company Tyco bought up Shaper, mostly to acquire their popular line of electric truck toys called Stompers, and either sold off or just plain discarded a bunch of other things that Shaper made, Animax included. While a run of the toys did make their way to store shelves, by the time the comic premiered, they were gone. Mel Burncrantz's site detailed the history of all this, but most interestingly, he also included the full scans of the comic that never saw print. Namely, the actual origin story of this series. For whatever reason, Marvel abandoned the original first issue, which actually explained the whole premise. Because we've got the unpublished first issue, we'll take a quick look at that one as well. Should have called this episode Animax Number Ones. The first page of the unpublished cover is basically the cover of the actual first issue, just slightly modified and with text. Out of the ashes of today, there grew a new world. The marketing department is still working on a name, but it will say that it was sponsored by Mountain Dew. A world scarred by a new breed of villains, but protected by a new breed of heroes. Unfortunately, inbreeding led to its downfall in a generation or two. The story of the Animax has just begun, and just as soon ended. So here's where we get the explanation for what the hell the deal is. By the 25th century, the Great Industrial Wars somehow caused the Earth to stop rotating on its axis. This results in a light side of the planet constantly exposed to sunlight that's basically a fertile paradise, and a night side occupied by wastelands and is perpetually gloomy and terrible. This, of course, raises several questions like, wait, is the moon still there? How is gravity affected by us no longer spinning? How is the light side a lush paradise if it's constantly exposed to sunlight? Isn't this affecting the water supply? What is this doing psychologically to people where there is no night? It just raises too many questions. Oh, but it continues from there. It seems that as Earth's natural resources began to run out, scientists decided that the best way to try to save animal species that were dying out was to use genetic engineering and cybernetics in a process called reincarnation to combine animals with vehicles. Thus, the Animax. I'd have Dr. Linksano appear to explain if any of this is scientifically feasible, but after I explained all this to him, he just started screaming and hasn't stopped for like three hours now. We meet some of those surviving humans who have made the horrifying sins against God in their jungle lair, which also serves as a service station for other people who are keeping their Animaxes in good shape. Which apparently involves polishing them, as we see with our lead hero, Max Action. No doubt joined by his brother, Supreme Exciting. We get introduced to the rest of the toys, I mean heroes, I mean toys. Tiger Tracker, spelled with two Ks, because poor literacy is cool. And his Animax, Turbo Tiger, Tarmac with Power Horse, and finally Rhinox with Off-Road Rhino Rammer. I'm sure I should make a Beast Wars reference with that name, but I'm more confused why they needed to specify that the Rhino Rammer was off-road. Were they afraid kids would only use him in paved environments? Now time to meet the villains, the Motor Mutants, along with their own vehicles, the Carnivars. It's a good thing lions and tigers aren't carnivorous, or this might be confusing. Their leader is Extinctor with Obliterator, which was apparently grown not from an animal, but a demon from Doom. Grease Kicker with Dreadful Dragster, Gross Out with Roadhog, and finally, Torrendous with Bulverizer. Honestly, I think the villains may have won this fight. Their toys sound much cooler, and don't point out which terrains they're best at traveling on. Extinctor himself is also a really cool design. Basically a skeletal demon with full-on bat wings. It'd be like if Skeletor joined a biker gang and lost some weight. The mutants head off for the Circle of Twilight. Even in the 25th century, they still make fun of that franchise. Or rather, the Circle is a band around the planet that's in perpetual twilight between the light and dark sides of the world. There's evidently only one bridge across it, the Bridge of Doom, which is also apparently alive, so make of that what you will. I mean, is the bridge supposed to have been reincarnated too? 
Extinctor leads his merry band in an attack on the Animax across the bridge. Turbo Tiger spots their approach from a distance, apparently heralded by a storm, and warns the rest of the Animax to prepare. Mount your steeds and don your telepathic helmets. Our mental links with the Animax, combined with their own courage and loyalty, should enable us to stop the carnivores before they cross the Bridge of Doom. Okay, at this point, I'm not going to question why you have helmets that grant you telepathy with your cyborg animal cars. But why are the helmets shaped like animals, too? I mean, I hate to sound judgmental, guys, but these are not great fursuits if we can see your human head in full display like that. The battle is joined on the bridge, with Extinctor trying to make the storm worse to affect their opponents, but Tarmac is unconcerned. Power Horse can't be stopped by any weather conditions, and I can telepathically fire my Power Pulverizer to cover you from enemy fire. So, is the gun part of the horse's anatomy, too? Unfortunately, it seems the Living Bridge suffers from a case of both sidesism, since it's neutral and has natural defenses that shove some of them around. We also learn why no one just tries to climb down into the Circle of Twilight. It's occupied by creatures called Crevators that Roadhog claims will eat him alive if he falls in. The mutants are forced into retreat as the battle continues on for a few pages. Rhinox wants to pursue and deal with them permanently, but a wall of flames blocks them, and Max Action says they pose no threat at this point and they'll always be ready to fight back again. Everyone pats themselves on the back for a job well done, revealing that the Animax can indeed respond with telepathy, so I guess their intellect got brought up a bit too. And now we can move into the series that was printed. Despite Burncrant's reservations on the cover that was printed versus the original drawing, I think it's still pretty damn good, showing Max Action and Extinctor duking it out atop their cars while they collide with each other. Honestly though, it highlights poor Max Action's outfit choice. A red, white, and blue ensemble, along with a weird yellow and red shield on his chest, a chain connecting his nipples for some reason, and finally the lion head helmet that completely clashes with the rest of his generic superhero attire. There. Sure glad I don't look stupid in this. We open with this. Our story begins with death! Destruction! Oh hey, it's the pitch meeting for Heroes in Crisis. The place is Earth. The time is the future. The temperature is in the lower 70s, moving into the 80s by the afternoon, cooler by the lake. It seems that the motor mutants have, well, succeeded, and Max Action is dead, his car lion named Jungle Max roaring in anger and sorrow at this. Man, I know the series was short, but I wasn't quite expecting that. The rest of the Animax soon show up and force the Motor Mutants into retreat. It seems Max is not quite dead yet, but he's mortally wounded. Easy man, easy. We'll get you back to Peopleopolis, Twin City of Humansburg. Tiger Tracker tries to reassure him that he'll be fine, but Max knows this is the end. And as the rain starts up, he says his farewell to the group, asking only for them to take out the mutants for him before he dies. This is a very tragic, somber sequence. At least it would be if this wasn't the first issue and the readers actually knew who the hell he was, what the premise of the series was, or knew why everyone had ridiculous animal-shaped helmets on that look even goofier up close. Burncrant actually really praised the idea of killing off the lead character right at the start and thought it was very original, but there's a reason why it's not really done, especially not in a series like this. Much like with Heroes in Crisis, if you're unfamiliar with the characters, it has no emotional resonance for you. Sure, you can try to backfill that with, say, flashbacks or the like, but we need something to start with or this scene rings as hollow. And this got released after the toys had already failed, so people reading it would especially not know or care about any of this. Mind you, Animax's solution to this issue is... um original, as we'll see, but we'll get to that later. Jungle Max is also not doing too hot, and apparently the helmets are only compatible with specific people, since they can't use the lion helmet to communicate with him. You can't hear my thoughts, Jungle Max, but I don't guess you have to now. The Dragway of Doom is the final highway for every Animax, and I reckon you'll be heading for the Animax graveyard, where even we road tamers have never been. In retrospect, that's kind of weird, since we invented you creatures and all, and should probably look into it, but it's kind of lightly raining right now, and I need to polish my tiger car. Jungle Max licks the dead body and then drives off. The Dragway of Doom has been summoned, and in the end, every Animax must ride that road to oblivion. Be sure to pack a lunch. So, how is this thing summoned exactly? And why must they ride it? Aren't these creatures created by, you know, 
humanity or by the mutants? Does this mean that lions are extinct now? They apparently have a hauler truck made out of an elephant that they call for to take the body back while Jungle Max drives off into the forest. Not far away, the motor mutants celebrate their victory, Extinctor planning to launch a full-scale attack on Peopleopolis while they're mourning and lacking leadership. We cut over to Peopleopolis, which seems to be a weird mixture of a bunch of different design aesthetics. It's also kind of interesting that the jungle lair isn't really a part of this, despite being in the original first issue. Walt Simonson was the writer for the first three issues, but I don't know if he did the original first issue as well, which might explain the incongruity between the stuff. While Max's body is left on a slab to be guarded, the rest of the Animax meet with the city's leadership to discuss what to do now. Rhinox wants to hunt down the mutants and even volunteers to be the new leader. This is fighting, fast and furious, and nobody's better at it than Rhino Rammer and I. Yeah, but maybe first you should get over that case of chicken pox you have, dude. While they continue their debate, we go back over to the mother caretaker who was left in charge of Max's body, which was apparently left at a museum. Time to clear the museum, good friends. We'll open again tomorrow morning. You can come stare at the recently deceased corpse then. With her is a woman named Heater, who could be her actual daughter, since she calls her that, though since her title is Mother Caretaker, that could just be part of the job or something. Anyway, the Mother Caretaker is the oldest human alive, and actually has a massive high-tech laboratory in the lower levels of the museum. She says that Max is the key to the survival of the Animax, and that mankind will perish without the Animax. She long ago began working on something that may give mankind a second chance. I have kept the knowledge secret even from you because I am afraid of it. Afraid of what ordinary men might do if they should learn such things. I thought this is where you kept all your baking recipes. It is! Mankind is unprepared for my banana bread! The great conflicts of the 21st century started when man began to think he knew all there was to know. He was wrong, of course. Didn't stop them from making YouTube tutorials about it all, though. But even though he was less wise than he thought, he knew enough to save some things when the fighting was over. You mean you know how the Animax came to be, Mother? There are some secrets, Heater, that I shall take to my grave! The unpublished first issue will never be seen, Heater! Never! So, what is it that she has here? A cloning machine, which she uses to make a duplicate of Max Action. Giant secret underground laboratory has a cloning machine. This woman is probably just a descendant of the Jackal. She, of course, points out that just having a clone body isn't enough. They have to transfer Max's mind from the dead body to the clone body. And we must do it before any time passes. I mean, it's been like hours since it happened, his brain is probably jelly at this point, and not going to be super full of a mind to transfer. A small band of mutants launch an attack on the rear entrance of the city, busting in to try to find and steal Max Action's body. In the lab, the transfer begins, and I joked about it a moment ago, but they do point out how there might have been too much deterioration for the transfer to work. Heater brings Tiger down to the lab to show him what they're doing, and apparently in the final stages, they disintegrate the original body! I guess if this doesn't work, they'll just use the clone body for the state funeral and not mention what happened. Tiger thinks this whole thing is bullcrap since it'd just be a copy of Max, not the real thing, but the philosophical implications are put on the back burner as the motor mutants storm in, somehow having found this place. They capture Tiger and Heater before they can sound the alarm, but then the Max clone wakes up and quickly kicks some ass. It's a good thing the cloning process duplicated his clothes, too. And his gun. Yeah, seriously, his gun got duplicated and he uses it, bouncing the beam off a mirror to take out the last of the mutants, who is holding Heater as a human shield. Those mutants will never bother a human again. Are you alright, Miss... uh... Heater. Heater Delight. Apparently in the future, we just pick two random words out of the dictionary for our names. Hey everybody, I'm Ballet Gummy Bear. Mother Caretaker has been mortally wounded. She tells the three that the best way to prove that Max is the real deal is by having him meet up with Jungle Max again. The telepathic bond between the two is that solid. She dies... And from a storytelling perspective, I'm quite happy about that, along with the fact that the lab is trashed. When I first flipped through this, I was worried that the cloning technology would remain, since that would mean, well, tension would kind of dissolve if it turned out that they could just 
clone another team member if they died. It is virtual immortality if the mind is transferred and not just copied over. And since Mother Caretaker seems to be the only one who knew about this tech, the secrets of it die with her. Max convinces Tiger he's the real deal by reciting his last words, so they now have to catch up with Jungle Max before he reaches the dragway of doom. Heater gives Max some high-grade fuel and sealant, which should help Jungle Max, making one wonder why they didn't just bring him back to use that or something else on him. He's still a living creature after all, you should try to help him. But before they can embark on that quest, the early warning sensors of the city sound the alarm. The mutants are launching a full-scale attack. The Animax bring their vehicles to the city walls to help defend it from the attack, and we get some neat shots of the siege. Tiger summons his Animax, and they take a secret passageway in the lab to another elevator up the city walls. And to a catapult that launches them over the attacking army. If they have catapults that can reach the distance beyond the attackers, why are they not being loaded up with bombs or something to actually hit the attackers. They head out into the forest to try to find Jungle Max. And so our comic ends with Extinction leading his forces in the attack, with a nicely ominous image of him cracking his whip in the air with lightning flashes behind him. It's actually kind of metal. I dig it. This comic is ridiculous, nonsensical, and silly, but it's not terrible. It's actually rather fun. Cloning and living animal cars and a bizarre future where everyone has stupid names. It's cheesy and glorious and I love it. I think we may have finally found our successor to Brute Force in this stuff. Even though it predates Brute Force. And I have no doubt we'll be revisiting Animax in the future. The unpublished first issue story is, well, barely a story. More of the tease of an ongoing story by establishing the main premise of the franchise. But it's okay if a bit wordy in that way that 80s comics tended to be, where everybody pontificates on what their powers are. The artwork on both is fine. Some good imagery and a few shots that are really nice, even if nothing is too spectacular or the like. Next time, we revisit Solson Publications, as we look at a comic... sort of. Kind of more of a training manual, really, in the art of ninjutsu. was just the first. Without him, Peopleopolis will fall before us like wheat before the scythe. Do a lot of wheat farming on the night side there, dude. Hello, my friends. Please be sure to like this video, subscribe, hit the bell, and share it with others. And if you get a chance, maybe check out my Patreon.